African suburbs, McCarthy's legacy in Rod Serling's Twilight Zone series. Adriana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I really want to talk to you today about uh, the American suburbs um, because I think that has a really interesting um, relationship with McCarthyism, paranoia, and surveillance. Um, how do I present this? It would be nice, but it's not the end of the world. American Suburbs, uh, and I'm going to talk about The Twilight Zone, which is a television show from the early 60s in the United States. I don't know if you've heard of it. There have also been a few reboots recently, um, one by Jordan Peele, the director of Get Out. Um, so anyway, uh, mine is going to be kind of a historical sociological look into these post-war suburbs. I'll do an analysis of The Twilight Zone episode, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. And then I'm going to finish with a quick then and now comparison um, of these lingering legacies of surveillance and conformity. So as you can see in this image on the screen, we have the white picket fence, an image and phrase meant to immediately evoke the American ideal of a house of one's own. In a picture-perfect suburb where children play on the streets and neighbors wave at each other from their front porches. Of course, the reality behind the creation of the American suburb, like so many things in America, is much more politically complex than the simple goal of attaining a home of one's own. In fact, in a way, the suburbs of the 1950s are a direct result of Joe McCarthy and his work pre what he's most well known for on the Senate Housing Committee. So first I'll quickly set the historical stage for post-war America, and then I'll delve a bit deeper into my claim that suburbia is in a way a product of McCarthyism. So after the end of World War II, <clears throat> Did the arrows at the bottom, maybe? But this screen looks different than what you guys were using, which is why I was thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. So um, after the end of World War II, thousands of young men were returning to the United States, ready to settle down and start a family. The government saw an opportunity to stimulate the economy through the immense and rapid creation of housing for this population. And therefore they promised through the GI Bill that veterans were entitled to interest-free mortgages and small down payment requirements. However, for reasons we will get into a bit more later, the government did not invest in public housing, but rather in private developers to create cheap and quick suburbs made of cookie cutter single family homes. Suddenly, the house with the white picket fence was not just a dream, but a perceived right that veterans had returning to the United States. To quote, the power of the dream was so persuasive that a Saturday evening post survey in 1945 revealed that only 14% of the population would be satisfied to live in an apartment or a used house. So now it wasn't even enough to live in a home. It had to be a home that no one had lived in before you. Um, that was suddenly perceived as a right. For the first time, middle to middle lower class families could afford their own home, equipped with televisions and the latest kitchen equipment. However, there was a darker side to these utopian suburbs as well, one that Joe McCarthy was instrumental in creating. So earlier I talked about 
how he was on the Housing Commission. In 1947 to 48, McCarthy dominated the U.S. Senate Joint Committee Study and Investigation of Housing Hearings. In these hearings, meant to brainstorm and enact policy to account for the housing shortage made possible by returning GIs, McCarthy relentlessly attacked proponents of public and affordable housing and framed cheap homes built by private developers as the antidote to socialism, both literally in that the government would not be paying for homes and ideologically in reinforcing the anti-communist American capitalist idea of owning private property. So this was like a two-pronged approach for him. Um, in fact, famously, McCarthy referred to one federally funded housing project for veterans as a government funded, quote, breeding ground for communists, end quote. So he's already framing the suburb as the antidote to communism. You have your own plot of land, you fill it with things that supposedly make your life easier. Um, so even before he's naming names and holding hearings, he's starting his work. Um, so let's see. In successfully pushing his politicization of housing and his framing of the suburbs as an antidote to communism, McCarthy enabled famous first suburb planners and builders like William Levitt to make money and mold these new communities in their own ideal. Levitt towns, as they were called, were built in New York and Pennsylvania and were among the cheapest homes available to families. They offered an opportunity to build on exclusion with charters stating that people of color were not permitted to purchase homes in these suburbs, and with many draconian rules about when washing could be hung out to dry, how lawns should be maintained. This legacy, in fact, is still alive in American suburbs, where homeowners associations that you have to be a part of in a neighborhood police each other's grass length and trash bin placement. Levitt often took from the McCarthy playbook, silencing any whispers of dissent in his suburbs with charges of communism. So there would even be flyers that would go around these suburbs, you know, kind of saying, using the rhetoric of, if you don't conform, then there must be something wrong about you or you don't belong here. Okay, so, um, sociologist Herbert Gans wrote um, a book about living in Levittown. He kind of got in on the ground floor and lived there for two years. Um, nowadays, it would be considered very inappropriate because he conducted surveys and spoke with his neighbors without telling them that he was, in fact, a sociologist conducting research. Um, but what he found by interacting with his neighbors, um, he thought that the negative aspects of suburbia were kind of overemphasized by scholars at the time. But he did agree that the suburbs were no place for difference, as you can see, um, not in this book. Sorry, <laughs> I think I'm going to add myself. Um, but he basically said uh, that in Levittown, um, it was not a place, obviously there was, it was built on racial exclusion. Um, and anyone who had a difference was very obviously not able to fit in and not having as good of a time as other neighbors who fit into this kind of homogenous set. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, with this quote that's been up here, it's just talking about how William Levitt and McCarthy were specifically entwined. Um, so it's no surprise that they are taking from each other and supporting each other. Um, so I wanted to talk about now surveillance and competition. Um, so just a few years after those hearing, house, uh, housing hearings, McCarthy's claim from Willing, Virginia in 1950 that he had a list of 205 spies in the State Department launched a five-year frenzy of mistrust and surveillance, the effects of which can be seen in miniature in the suburbs. While the nosy neighbor here, this is a character called Mrs. Kravitz from the 1964 American show Bewitched, um, is often kind of used for comedy, there's actually a much more sinister aspect to this. In the article Picture Windows, Architecture of Privacy and Surveillance, um, Harju describes the unique push and pull of privacy versus surveillance in these suburbs. In fact, there's an inherent paradox in suburban life, especially during this area, era, excuse me, that the promise of a house of one's own conjures images of privacy and one's own domain. However, these homes were not really designed for privacy. They had large picture windows. One could not only look out, but your neighbors could look in. 
These vigilant neighbors attempted to weed out nonconformity based on the fear of otherness and the mold in McCarthy's nebulous warnings of un-American activities. When discussing McCarthyism, we often think of his high profile witch hunt of Hollywood writers and stars with the blacklist, but his red scare took the professional and social lives of many everyday people as well. One such case that has come to light more recently is that of the librarian Mary Knowles, who lost her job and was blacklisted for working at a children's library that happened to have some leftist leanings. Libraries themselves were considered to have leftist leanings at this time. Um, at the time, the civil vigilance seemed like a fair trade to protect themselves from the frightening Soviet Union and its threat of nuclear annihilation. It's always this constant, and it still happens in the United States today, of trading liberties for protection and how well your leader can convince you that you need your protection is going to directly affect how many liberties you're willing to have to you. Um, so now quickly, um, okay, this was the quote I was talking about. So um, those who don't live up to the rules of home ownership, those who don't fit in are dissatisfied in these suburbs, but we don't hear about them. They're obviously not what we're trying to sell with the American um, so uh, the Twilight Zone is an example of science fiction in a way, um, and so I wanted to talk about science fiction briefly. Um, I'm sure that you, when you think about 1950s science fiction, it's pretty um, tied to the Red Scare, the fear of the atomic bomb, this immense paranoia of something that 20 years ago was science fiction, and now you've actually witnessed, you know, Hiroshima and the constant threat of a nuclear attack um, from the Soviet Union as well. Um, so it's no surprise that science fiction flourishes at this time. Um, so let's see. Um, on television, science fiction and allegory were a, a way around censors and fear um, that sponsors wouldn't advertise on too politically loaded of a program. Um, so you can always kind of hide a little bit with science fiction as well. Um, the message is there, but you can also kind of feign ignorance if maybe you were to be um, censored in some way. Um, so I want to talk about this a little bit, <laughs> which is a, a short story um, from the 1950s, actually one year before the Twilight Zone episode that I'm going to, to talk about. Um, and it directly draws from some of these ideas and it's called I Flinglot Who You. Um, and so it's basically the idea that this alien comes and whispers in the ears of the Soviets and whispers in the ears of the Americans and whispers in the ears of the French and says, oh, we have this you know, alien planet and they want to make contact. So this alien convinces all of the separate powers that they are the ones. Well, then he orchestrates that the spaceship lands in North Africa and everybody thinks they've been double crossed and it's supposed to start a nuclear war that knocks everyone out without him having to do anything essentially. Um, so you can see here when he's talking to another alien, you cause dissension, you pitted us one against the other so that the nation no longer trusted one another. So this idea of trust is there as well. Um, uh, however, in this story, which is different than the Twilight Zone episode that I'm gonna talk about, there's an optimistic ending, which sort of suggests that America has learned from its mistakes, which you can see in this quote, like specifically referencing the Senate committee hearings, um, characters have been destroyed, policies have been wrecked. So essentially all of the powers join together and keep this annihilation from happening because they've learned from their mistakes of the Cold War. Um, the Twilight Zone episode that I'm gonna talk about does not have quite a, such a positive worldview. <laughs> um, so uh, I also just wanted to very briefly mention that there were other kind of suburban focused science fiction um, novels that then became films. Um, so these are uh, The Body Snatchers, which became the film The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Stepford Wives, they all kind of play on this idea of um, waking up and suddenly not belonging, or waking up and realizing that your difference is kind of keeping you apart. Or So it kind of is this ironic thing where you're you're scared of losing your suburban existence, but your suburban existence is actually what is making you not an individual. So it's this kind of push and pull. Again, you can 
you can read it how you want to. If you want to read them as the fear that you're going to wake up and communism has taken over, or if you're going to read them as the fear that this is what happens when you turn against each other and root out all individuality, it's interesting in that you can kind of make it adapt. Um, so I know I'm running out of time. So um, The Twilight Zone uh, is an anthology series written by Rod Serling for the most part. Um, he presents them as well. Um, and this is kind of an example of what I was saying before. So the creator says a Martian can say things that a Republican or a Democrat cannot. Um, so again, science fiction is a way to talk about politics, to talk about these things maybe earlier than you normally would be able to if you were being very on the nose. Um, so this was, and we talked about, I talked a little bit about advertising. That's something specific to television as well, where you couldn't scare away your advertisers. So this um, aired in 1960, and it was one of the first TV shows to kind of explicitly address the McCarthy era, which at that time still felt quite recent. Um, so uh, the episode that I was talking about is called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. Um, and essentially, it's a very simple premise, but very effective. Um, you open on this beautiful, idyllic street. Everybody's playing together, talking. And all of a sudden, all of the lights go out. All of the cars stop working. No radios are working. Um, and so a little boy comes up and is like, this is exactly how it happens in my science fiction comics, except that the aliens never look like aliens. They look like one of us. So then the seed of fear and paranoia is planted just from this child's kind of offhand comment. Um, so then they start looking at each other. They're not sure what to do. And someone's car starts. And so immediately they're all going to this person. Could it be you? Are you involved? Why is your car working? And then they say, um, you know, something's wrong with him. He's, I see him out at night looking at the stars. Or the other man, he's in the basement making radios. He's probably talking to aliens. So like you start drawing upon this suburban surveillance that you've maybe been doing without even realizing to point the finger at your neighbors. Um, so yeah, let's pick out every idiosyncrasy of every man, woman, and child on this whole street. Then let's set up a kangaroo court. Like that's pretty explicit, right? Uh, the McCarthy hearings. Um, so in the end, it devolves very quickly. <laughs> I was going to show you a clip, but I don't think I have time. But um, I think you can tell from these stills, it's uh, very dramatic. Um, but it's basically um, everything happens. They start to turn on each other. It becomes just a frenzied mob turning on each other. Can't stop themselves. And then you pan up to these aliens who are watching from a high hill and they comment to each other, you know, um, See, we didn't even have to lift the finger. All we had to do was plant this seed of doubt, this seed of paranoia, and they'll take care of it themselves. So I was struck by how similar it was to that short story that was only a year before this episode aired. But in this one, mankind has indeed destroyed themselves. They haven't learned from their mistakes. And that's what you see um, Rod Serling always kind of ends um, with a moral. <laughs> um, and so he says, you know, there are weapons that are thoughts, attitudes, prejudices to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudices can kill and suspicion can destroy. And a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has fallout all its own for the children and the children yet come born. So again, we are all inheriting this legacy of paranoia, which I'm going to blow through really quickly in my discussion, which is like, what liberties do we give up? So what liberties were given up after September 11th in the United States? All of a sudden we have homeland security. We have this, um, this uh, if you see something, say something campaign. So do you know the signs of suspicious activity? Well, let's see what they are. Suspicious activity is any of your behavior that could indicate terrorism or terrorism related crime. Sounds very similar to whatever nebulous meaning un-American activity. To me. Um, and um, this was kind of talking about the Trump era and the paranoia that comes along with that as well. Um, in this book uh, called Demagogue that was written recently about um, McCarthy, these quotes were brought up together. So McCarthy had killed five children 
everybody would still do what he said. And Trump famously saying, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any of my core voters. So there are these startling similarities still. Um, so another thing is this like idea of felt power deprivation. So if you convince people that someone else is taking their power, this idea of the scapegoat, this paranoia around the scapegoat, um, you can get them to vote for you even though it's a vote against their own interests when you look at it. Um, so this was a, a Trump quote, uh, people living their suburban lifestyle dream will no longer be bothered or financially hurt by having low income housing built in your neighborhood. So we have barely moved beyond the initial idea of suburbs versus public housing communism versus the capitalist dream, you know, the most capitalist presidents, um, you know, our businessman Trump. Um, it's still very much in our psyche. It is inherited, like they said at the end of the Twilight Zone. Your children and your children unborn will have this paranoia and it will just change shape and continue to move. Um, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to go there. Yeah. Thank you.